structure of the could talk half an hour 35 minutes that's the that's the idea And philosophy a counter name of the website is the uh, Krishna the open library and on the website you can find 90 something percent of Daji's writings, uh, both in English and in Hindi. So, my talk basically is a window, an open window to Daji's own uh, writings, to Daji's own voice. So, it's an invitation to you to, to, to listen and to read Daji firsthand. So, I met him through a book. I read a book by him in Tel Aviv. I was totally captivated by the book. It was not just the intriguing co uh, content comprising of a new reading of classical Indian philosophy, but the way it was written. A postgraduate student of philosophy at the time, I could feel that something was happening in the book. In retrospect, this happening can be formulated through the Krishna's own distinction between thinking and thought. In his essay, Thinking versus, thinking versus Thought, Strategies for Conceptual Creativity. I will mention several several titles of several works by da krishna to give you to give you a feeling to give you a sense of 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 the way that he was approaching classical indian and and western also texts so listen to the title thinking versus thought strategies for conceptual creativity from 1988 here he makes a distinction between thinking as a dynamic continuous living process and thought as the tentative pro product of thinking. For him, books and essays are just, are just stops on the thinking journey. Or to use another metaphor, they are like windows through which the reader can look into the author's creative thinking process. Moreover, they work as an open invitation for the reader to come on board Door one steamy over. Most decade long relationship with endless hours of philosophical discussion which continued until his last day in October 2007. In a nutshell, now I'm trying to, to capture the, the corpus. In a nutshell, Da Krishna's corpus can be classified into three main sections or rubrics. Or if you wish, we can speak of his three main projects. First, theorizing socially for India as a new nation state, a project that he worked on throughout his writing life, from the 1950s onwards. Second, the Samvad project, or the dialogue project, if you wish, that Da Krishna initiated in the 1980s with colleagues such as M. P. Rege, R.C. Duivedi, and Mukund Lark. I don't know if the names are familiar to you, but this is why I mentioned them in your ears Mukund Lark, Rege Sahab, and the R.C. Duivedi. The idea behind this project, Da Krishna explains in the preface of his book, Discussion and Debate in Indian Philosophy from 2004, 
was to bring together, quote, active practitioners of the two philosophical traditions, the Indian and the Western, in a dialogical situation where each was forced to existentially face, to existentially face, the living tradition of, of a different way of philosophizing, unquote. These were meeting pundits and philosophers, two groups of contemporary Indian uh, philosophers, pundits and professors, I, I, I wanted to say. These were meetings between pundits and professors, two groups of contemporary Indian philosophers, divided by philosophizing language, right? The pundits are writing and thinking, thinking and writing in Sanskrit. The professors, the university professors were, were, were trained in Western philosophy. And you know that pundits and professors don't often meet I think that this department is, is a rare occasion. Some of your teachers are both pundits and uh, professors. So, so usually the professor, professor, that can we? Because the system is the host of this program, that's why. Right. I see. That so can you put it on silence or something? Volume, volume off, Karna. Thank you. So. So usually the, the, the professors think that the pandits are these ancient creatures doing something old instead of being open to, to, to new strands in philosophy. This is the, the, the professor's uh, prejudice. And the pandits think that the, the professors are, are too westernized. So that Krishna was trying to... to and, and, and you know that the pandits and the professors are, are neighbors. Actually, they work... I mean, door next to door, without knowing what is happening in the next room. So Daiji invited the, the pundits and the professors to meet and to, and to, and to discuss and to, to, to create something together. So I'm saying these, these two groups of contemporary Indian philosophers are divided by philosophizing language and intellectual education, but united by, by what? This was one of the implied questions in this series of meetings, and no, Unified, unified by country of residence, nationality and history before the colonial bifurcation is not good enough answer. The participants were united by their willingness to converse across a wide philosophical gap that history has created between them. The Samvad project aspired to deal with an intellectual partition, and I'm using a very strong word, an intellectual partition, and to take initial steps in the direction of a, of a fracture repair. So now I wrote to myself in Hebrew, I wrote to myself in Hebrew that I should tell you a few words about the difficulty of, of, of creating a dialogue, because you know that everybody is, to, is talking about dialogue. Let's start a new party. I mean, who is interested in BJP, Congress, I'm admin party. Let's start a new party and call it the dialogue party. This sounds great, right? आशीष जी एक बार ऑन करा दीजिए उधर से डिस्कनेक्ट हो गया है Because you know that, that a large part of classical Indian philosophy is written in this uh, Siddhantin Purva Pakshin tradition. The philosopher has to write his, his opponent's point of view. Now, this is a very difficult task to do. And if I'm writing, if Shankara Acharya, for example, Ananji, is writing the position of the Buddhists, he cannot write the position of the Buddhists in a weak way. Because if he writes it in a weak way, there is no, there is no point. It's like playing chess against myself. So I'm playing both with the white uh, pieces and, and, and with the black pieces. So I have to, to play at my best, 
both in the white and in the black uh, pieces. And I think that it might be the case, and I'm asking Ananji, that Ananji, not this uh, Ananji, that sometimes, for example, Shankara is presenting the Buddhist view in such a wonderful way that one is convinced. And when Shankara tries to, to reply the Buddhist position, perhaps we are not as convinced as when he presents the, the opponent's uh, position. So this, this, uh, this sense of, of sincerity in presenting, in projecting the, the, the opponent's view, I think can give us a, a, a hint, can give us a, a feeling, can give us the experience of what, what it is like to, to engage, to really engage in a, in a dialogue. So I'm talking about uh, Da Krishna's uh, main projects. The first one was uh, social philosophy, socializing, socializing for the newly created the India after, I mean, before and after the independence. Secondly, I said the Samvad project. I will say something more on the Samvad project as I go on. And that, that Krishna's third main project was about reading classical Indian texts anew. To read classical texts anew. And, and I, I, I don't know about you today, but when Daiji started to do it, again, we are talking about the 1950s, the 1960s, this was not a, a very simple task because the texts belong. And again, I'm using a very harsh word, they belong to the Pandits. How can I read the Vedanta text if I'm not a Vedantin? How can I read the Nyaya text if I'm not a Nyayika Pandit? How can I read the Mimansa text, etc., etc.? And Daiji, I think, showed us, showed you, that, that you, can, you can actually take the texts and, and read them, not just the textbook, but, but the actual uh, text. So I spoke to you in my previous talk about newness and uh, philosophy, and I want to say a few more words about a new reading. What is a new reading? Is there a new reading at all uh, in philosophy? So I'm quoting to you from a letter that Daji wrote to, a friend, to his friend, novelist, poet, thinker, Ramesh Chandra Shah in 2006. And Daji just received a new book written by, by Shah Sahab. The title of the book, it's a 2006 book, is Ancestral Voices. So Shah Sahab wrote something on the, on, on the classics. So Daji writes, Dear R.C. Shah. I don't know, I mean, nowadays we hardly write letters, right? But Daji used to write letters and receive letters. This was before the, the quick emails or the quick uh, WhatsApps. So he took the time to, to, to think and to write, and you know, the letter went, and then letters came back, etc. So Daiji writes to his friend Shah Sahab, ancestral voices reached me a few days ago. I mean, the book reached him. Just as I, along with many others, was trying to close my ears to them, to the ancestral voices, in order to hear and listen better the voices from the future. And he writes future with, with, with capital uh, letters. Beckoning us and challenging to think and act in a new way. And then Daiji writes to his friends, As ancestors are all right. I love this uh, Ancestors are all right, but one is to remember them only once a year during the Shraddha period and then forget them for the whole rest of the year. Their achievement is well known, as we shall not be what we are without them. But their failure, their failures are equally obvious, as we ourselves illustrate them in our life perpetually. And so did they, if the stories about them in the sacred texts themselves are to be believed. Still, after telling his friend, let's forget about ancestral voices and do something new, but then he concludes and writes, still it is good to be reminded, and I look forward to reading what you have written on the subject. So the question is, whether there is any, anything new in philosophy. A question that I raised here in my previous talk, or is contemporary philosophy just a footnote, a la Whitehead, to the writings of the great minds of the past? Whitehead famously wrote that, I'm quoting him, the safest, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato or to Plato of Ilahabad, I'm telling uh, uh, Ananji. Are we to assume then that contemporary Indian philosophy, Da Krishna included, is just a series of footnotes to classical thinkers of the past, to the Upanishads, Nagarjuna, Dharmakirti, and Shankara, as much as, let us not forget, colonialism and Macaulay, 
to Plato, Aristotle, Kant, and Hegel. And you remember the Alu Gobi illustration that I gave here uh, just a few days ago. Alu Gobi is Alu Gobi is Alu Gobi. Really. But that Krishna wholeheartedly believed that we can and must do something new in philosophy rather than being nostalgic and rooted in the, in the quote, wonder that was. So Daji was not interested in, in the was. He was interested in the is. Let me give you an illustration or, or two of newness in Da Krishna's reading of classical Indian philosophy. It is not easy to choose just a single instance of newness in Da Krishna. His reading of classical Indian sources is so original that I always suspected that there was some jadu in his chashma, which enabled him to see things differently. Take, for instance, his paper. I told you that I'm going to mention titles to you. So take, for instance, his paper, Adhyasa, a non-Advaitic beginning in Shankara's Vedanta from 1983. Adhyas, in Hindi, a non-Advaitic beginning in Shankar's Vedant. Here he reads Shankara's Brahma Sutra Bhashya and is puzzled by the very first sentence of Shankara's introduction, his famous Adhyasa Bhashya. In this opening sentence, as all of you, I wrote all in capital letters, all of you would know, Shankara writes, the object, Vishaya, and the subject, Vishayin, manifested respectively in the ideas of you and I, Yushmat and Asmat Pratyaya, are different from one another like darkness and light, and should not be identified with one another. Right, this is Shankara's first uh, sentence. That Krishna is surprised, that Krishna is surprised, by Shankara's definition of Adhyasa as the mistaken identification of you and I. From an Advaitic, non-dualistic perspective that Krishna thinks out loud, the error, the mistake, should be the other way around. For the Advaitin, and Shankara is supposed to be the champion of Advaita, everything which diverts from the equation I am thou, as that Krishna's contemporary Ramchandra Gandhi titled his, his magnum opus from 1984 is an error. You, you understand the, the problem? I mean, the, 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 the Adhyasa Bhasha starts with the object and the subject are different from one another like day and night. So Daiji says, but, but it should not be the case. From the Advaitic point of view, the mistake should be to differentiate between the object and the subject. They should be one and the same thing. Why and how, then, that Krishna wonders, does, Sh does Shankara choose to open the introduction of his commentary with the formulation of Adhyasa, which is compatible with the dualistic position of his rivals from the Sankhya school of thought? And I'm mentioning this to you because the question is interesting. He's questioning a text that all of us have read, but, but somehow we managed to read it without raising, raising the questions. Now, there are, there are possible answers to this question. Perhaps Shankara is starting really with the Purva Paksha, with the position of the Sankhya school of thought. Another possibility is that his readers, his students, are not aware as yet of his Advaitic position. So he's starting, if you want, with the common sense perspective, which, which shows me that you are there and I'm here, that there is a, a gap between us. So, so a non-Advaitic beginning to, to Shankara's introduction. This is one example of, of Da Krishna's, what, what I'm calling Da Krishna's new point of view. Da Krishna's full move can be found in his paper. Again, I'm, 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 I'm telling you the title, Adhyasa and Non-Advaitic Beginning in Shankara's Advaita, which is accessible on dakrishna.org. I wish to push forward with another illustration of newness in Da Krishna. In his essay, Socio-Political Socio Thought in Classical India, I told you that the first uh, project was to, to, to write, to create social philosophy for, for India. So in his essay, Socio-Political Thought in Classical India from 1997, that Krishna suggests that every political theorist should be interested in the radically individualistic implications of the theory of karma, which lead, he argues, 
to moral monotheism. What is moral monotheism? And why and how would the theory of karma lead to moral monotheism? According to the theory of karma, as all of you would know again, one's present position in the world is the causal result of one's actions in the past. In the same way, one's present actions will determine one's future position. It is implied, and this is Dr. Krishna's concern, that the karma theory leaves no place for the other, for you. The other, at best, is instrumental to enable me to bring to fruition the karmic baggage that I carry along, and hopefully to acquire, owing to my attitude towards him or her, punya, merit, good karma, that will have positive future consequences. One can hardly affect the other. One's actions determine one's own karma and one's future born of this karma. Morally speaking, then, each to his own. I'm looking at you to see if you are surprised or if you agree or if you disagree or if you're starting to think about the collective karmas. Who is talking about collective karmas? Is it, is it an old idea? Is it a new idea? That Krishna does not hesitate to reveal a flaw or what he sees as a flaw in one of the foremost assets of the Indian culture, the theory of karma. But this is not all. But this is not all. How does this moral monadism, Da Krishna further wonders, fit with the entire procedure of the Vedic Yagya? Sacrifice. In the Yagya, the Yajamana, the patron of the ritual, hires the services of a Ritvika, right? A priest, to perform the ritual for him. The labor, the craft, the doing are all the priests. Hence, according to the theory of karma, the fruits should be his. Are you following? A Ritvik is doing the, the, the ritual, so he should get the fruits, and not the Ajaman who is sponsoring the, the ritual. But surprisingly, it is the Ajaman who enjoys, or is supposed to enjoy, the fruits of this action. The whole ritual is formed to enable him to reap the fruits. In light of this alleged contradiction, alleged contradiction between karma and yagya, Da Krishna appeals to an ensemble of pandits of the Mimansa tradition to ask them if Jaimini, author of the Mimansa Sutra, quote, accepts the principle that whoever does the karma, its fala goes to him only, or does Jaimini have a different theory of action? I cannot delve into the, this intriguing dialogue between Da Krishna and the Mimansakas. It appears in Da Krishna's book, Discussion and Debate in Indian Philosophy, that I mentioned before, which you can find on the website. The novelty lies in his ability to raise sharp questions. Moral monadism, a conflict between karma and yagya, that trigger a new discussion about the main theories of action in classical Indian philosophy. But I wish to add the following. It is a fact of life that people often work together, collaborate, cooperate, and enjoy the fruits of their action together. Even this, this could be an, an example. Rajendra Swarup Bhatnagar, a contemporary philosopher from Jaipur who passed away three years ago, goes as far as suggesting that every human action is a collaboration carried out in a setting which enables or at least does not prevent its performance. Hence, the idea of my action, according to him, to Rajendra Swarup Bhatnagar, is a misnomer. It is also a fact of life that people share the pain and pleasure of others around them, the fruits of their karma, if you wish. That Krishna calls our attention to the fact that this shareability does not find adequate expression either in the karma or the yagya theories of action. I now wish to take a step forward and try to give you a taste of Da Krishna's Samvad project. Let us visit shortly one of Da Krishna's final, final rounds of Samvad, a written Samvad. Maybe, maybe, maybe I should have told you that the Samvad meetings uh, were conducted in the 1980s and, and, and the, the, the professors, the university professors went, traveled to meet Pandits in different places of this uh, vast uh, country. They went, for example, to Sarnath to meet the uh, Nayaika scholars. And this is a very interesting Samvad. Maybe you know of one of the products of this uh, Samvad, an essay 
a written, composed by, by a famous uh, contemporary, Banarsi, Nayaika, I'm talking about Pandit uh, Badrina Chukla. The title of this essay is The Hatmavad. The Hatmavad, translated very gently into English by, by Mukun Lat as the body is the soul. And, and, and Mukunji wrote something like, an exploration of a possibility in the Nyaya tradition. But Badrina Chukla did not write an exploration of a possibility. He gave this blunt, this, this blunt title, Dehat Mavad. This, if you want, we can we can discuss later if we have time. It's already it's already five. So so the first Samvad meetings were, were taking place in 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 Sarnath, in Tirupati, in in Srinagar. The professors went to meet uh, uh, Swami Laks Lakshmanju uh, to 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 discuss uh, Kashmir Shaivism in Aligar to meet the ulama, ulama, a Muslim or Muslim, if you want to pronounce it this way, Muslim scholars. So there was a sense of, of, of hospitality. The pandits gave, a, if you want, both physical, but mostly intellectual hospitality to the professors that came to, to stay with them, to be with them, to, to think together with them. But then you know what happens. Of course you know, because the Buddha, I mean, the Buddha gave his first sermon not far, far from here. Everything that is born gets old. And the Daiji and, and his collaborators, collaborators grew old and it was difficult to travel. So the last Samvad was done uh, in a written form. It was done in a written form. And this Samvad begins with that Krishna's paper. Again, I'm telling you the title, Vedanta in the first millennium AD. A case study of a retrospective illusion imposed by the historiography of Indian philosophy. Again, I'm reading to you the title. Everything started with this paper that was sent to a group of pandits, I will tell you in a second. So that Krishna's paper's title is Vedanta in the first millennium AD, a case study of a retrospective illusion imposed by the, histor by the historiography of Indian philosophy. Daji wrote this paper in 1996. The idea is that the Vedanta scholars until today, I mean, wait for the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, you will meet Vedanta scholars that will tell you Vedanta, Indian philosophy is Vedanta. Everything started with Vedanta and continued with Vedanta and Bhagavad Saab does, does, does not agree according to his, to his response here. Vedanta from beginning to end. So Daji was checking Vedanta text in the first millennium AD. How did he do it? He was using two bibliographies composed simultaneously by two pandits, an American pandit, an American pandit, and I mean, you must have heard of him, uh, Carl uh, Potter, the bibliography volume of the famous, uh, his famous encyclopedia of, uh, of uh, Indian uh, philosophies, and, the, and, and pandit uh, Tangaswamy from uh, University of Madras. So these two scholars separately, independently from one another, gave, give us a list of all the Indian texts known to us from beginning to, to contemporary times. And, and Daji is simply counting the texts in the first millennium, and he hardly finds any Vedanta texts. Of course, I mean, first millennium, millennium he finds mostly Buddhist texts and then Yaya texts. So Daji writes, where is Vedanta in the first millennium? This is the this is the beginning of, of, of this uh, Samvad. But the beauty is that that, the beauty, I think that it's beautiful that that Krishna is raising a question. So he wrote this paper and he did not publish it, I don't know, in some, some famous uh, a journal, but instead he sent it to, to pandits of, of the Vedanta tradition to, to see what they have to say. He want, just like uh, Anand here, he wanted to study from them. He wanted to learn from them. So he's asking them, where is Vedanta in the first millennium? I can't find Vedanta. I mean, except for Badarayana and Shankara and some direct students of Shankara, I see Buddhism, I see Nyaya. This is what Daji writes to this uh, ensemble of, 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 uh, of Vedanta, Vedanta pandits, insiders, if you want, in the Vedanta tradition, which claims for hegemony during this period, or in fact, from the Upanishads uh, onwards. And that Krishna wonders about the politics of history making and about the hand which writes the narratives that we are so used to. And this is what he writes, I'm quoting, 
There is practically no Vedanta in the first millennium AD, and the idea of its dominant presence is a superimposition by the historiography of Indian philosophy, superimposition. Again, we are with Adyas. The propounders of the theory of Adyas have perhaps themselves imposed one on the history of philosophy in India. This is Daya Krishna. So now there are many, I mean, again, you can check it out in, in discussion and debate in Indian philosophy on the website. So there are different answers to Daya Krishna's qu query. So for example, Suresh Chandra, a, a, a wonderful scholar, he tells Daiji, Vedanta in the first millennium exists in the heart, in the hearts of the believers. In the hearts of the believers. This is an interesting answer. It is very difficult to know what is happening in the hearts of, 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 of anyone. I mean, for example, I'm wondering what is happening in your hearts at this very moment. So, so it's a good answer. It's, it's an answer of a, of, a, of a believer, but it takes the discussion from philosophy to another domain. So this is one, one answer. Another an answer is given by our friend. Godavari Mishra. So Godavari Mishra tells the IG there must have been many Vedanta texts, but they, they, they are gone. They disappeared. They are, they are no longer with us. So again, this answer is not a bad answer, but so Daji writes back. I mean, Daji answers these pundits by one by one. So Daji says, look, if these texts will be found, and if you are right that these texts existed, so then of course I will have to, to re-examine my, my position. But I'm working with the, with the materials, with the facts, with the texts that are available to me right now. And then comes into the picture, as my friend Andanji knows, a Professor R. Bal Subramaniam, a great uh, Vedantin of our time. We used to call him Professor Arbi. So I will refer to him, I will address him as Professor Arbi. So I wrote that Krishna is further challenged by R. Bal Subramaniam, Professor Arbi. First, it is interesting to notice that Arbi uses the terms Vedanta and Advaita Vedanta, or simply Advaita, interchangeably. For him, Vedanta is primarily Advaita Vedanta, and he's, he's not the only one. Second, his critique of that Krishna focuses on the concept of Adhyasa. He accuses that Krishna of using this term too loosely. If the framework is broken, he argues, and anyone can use a term here at Yasa, in his own way, a meaningful dialogue cannot take place. Now, this is a, this is a very good uh, point. He tells that Krishna, what, what exactly do you mean when you're saying a superimposition on, on the historiography, thank you, of, of, of Indian philosophy? Um, where am I? If the exchange between Daya Krishna and the insiders is about his historical hegemony, then Bal Subramaniam takes this hegemony debate in a new direction, concentrating on hegemony and language. The question is what is legitimate or illegitimate in language, and what amount of freedom is allowed when using a classical concept such as Adyasa? It is a question about context and framework, fidelity and transgression. The concept of Adyasa, Bal Subramaniam explains, is a matter of perceptual error and has nothing to do with the historiography. Hence, Daya Krishna's remark and Adyasa imposed on the history of philosophy has no meaning. He implies that unless context and, and framework are kept, there is no common ground for mutual understanding. Daya Krishna's present concern is Vedanta in the first millennium, but he will come back to Adyasa in and out of context and to the philosophical implications of this pivotal concept in a separate article, a sort of appendix to the present, present Samvad, which he titled, Can the Analysis of Adyas Ever Lead to an Advaitic Conclusion? So you see how a dialogue works. Everyone contributes something, and this, this triggers a new, a new stream of thinking, and, and, and a new article, a new, a new article, a new work. Bhai Subramaniam continues to attack Daya Krishna severely and refers to him as idol worshiper i'm quoting of the various idols he writes which that krishna seems to worship that of the number is very conspicuous we know that in politics 
the strength of a view is dependent on the number of persons who support it. A particular view becomes dominant and prevails over others if the supporters are numerically in a majority. However, the politics of the number has no place in philosophy. So he's quote unquote blaming Daiji for, for bringing politics into the, again, quote unquote, pure realm of thinking. But is thinking really this quote unquote, and again, I'm using quote unquote, 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 pure realm, is there? such a thing as, as pure realm. I'm, I'm writing, this is a, a, a wonderful paragraph, the, the, the paragraph which, which with this attack on Daya Krishna, an, an idol worshiper. First, since Shankar, whose notion of Adhyasa became the bone of contention between Bal Subramaniam and Daya Krishna, pre prefers, Shankar prefers the abstract Nirguna Brahman over the palpable Saguna deities. Hence, devalues idol worship. To call Daya Krishna an idol worshiper is to imply that he's an outsider to Shankara's philosophical framework or tradition. But Daya Krishna is not just an idol worshiper. He's an idol worshiper of the worst kind. His idol, according to Bal Subramaniam, is the number. A master of rhetoric, Bal Subramaniam accuses Daiji for defiling the quote-unquote, I just said, pure realm of philosophy, and moreover, spirituality with politics. The number belongs to politics, he writes, not to philosophy. Ouch, was my first response. But the whole discussion here is about the politics of ideas. That Krishna hints that owing to modern agendas, Neo-Vedanta imposes a picture of Indian philosophy which projects Vedanta as dominant from the very beginning. Bal Subramaniam, a master of Vedanta, quotes from Shankara's commentary on the Taittiriya Upanishad, where he claims that, I'm quoting Bal Subramaniam's translation, a philosophical position, position cannot be considered to be sound just because the number of its votaries is legion, as Bal Subramaniam puts it. Moreover, metaphysically, Shankara anyway prefers the one over the many. But is it a convincing objection to that Krishna's counting experiment and to his conclusion that the majority of the texts in the historical period under discussion are non-Vedantic? The prejudice for number is deep-rooted in human nature. Bal Subramaniam continues to twist his philosophical knife, I mean, in Daiji. And that Krishna's argument in this case shows that he is a victim of the Idola tribus. Bal Subramaniam, I comment, we discover, is not just the first class Sanskritist, but the frequent visitor in another classical language, Latin, Idola Tribus. The phrase Idola Tribus, tribus refers to the idols of the tribe. That Krishna is lucky, I thought to myself as I read Bal Subramaniam, that he was not accused by his knowledgeable opponent of falling victim to the Idola foreign, the idols of, idols of the marketplace. It is said of Moshe Sne, an Israeli politician and, and members of the first Knesset, the Israeli parliament, that he wrote on the draft of one of his famous speeches, weak argument, he wrote to himself, he was reading a speech in the parliament, so he wrote to himself, weak argument, raise voice. My feeling is that the Latin phrase works in the same way as raising one's voice. But Subramaniam opens the final paragraph of his response to Daya Krishna, with the claim that, again I'm quoting, the Vedantic thought of the Upanishads constitutes the philosophia perennis, which has endured through the ages. And he closes this paragraph and his whole paper with this, comple with this complementing claim, the Vedanta philosophy of the Upanishads is indeed the rock of ages, which one has to encounter and reckon with in doing philosophy. The phrases philosophia, perennis, and rock of the ages, again Latin and in capital letters, truly convey the conviction, the conviction of Bal Subramaniam and, and the other insiders who participated in this Sampad about the significance of Vedanta philosophy and its essential texts. Bal Subramaniam strives to place a firewall between the quote-unquote trusted insiders 
and they again quote unquote intruding questions of the outsider in this case the krishna but that you believe that the philosopher the philosophical position is always the the the, the is always from the outsiders from the outsiders the uh, outsiders what position place the idea is that even if you're an insider to be able to to read your own tradition you should take a step out there is this uh, famous statement but famous sense statement sentence by salman uh, rushdi he says the only ones that can see the whole picture are those who step out of the frame so in this case the ig is blamed but i think that the ig consciously steps out of the frame in order to see a larger a larger picture so the intruding questions of the outsider no wonder i write that that krishna titled his reply to bal subramaniam and the others now i'm giving you the title of the of the paper that he wrote in 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 reply it is titled the shock proof evidence proof argument proof world of sampradayika scholarship of indian philosophy the shock proof evidence proof argument proof world of sampradayika scholarship of indian philosophy conveying his frustration whatever i will tell you you will never be convinced you are you are too deeply inside but who is right i'm asking who wins the debate that krishna or professor arbi i think that each of them makes a strong point that krishna about the diversity of voices in indian philosophy Indian philosophy is not just Vedanta and is not subordinated, subordinated to the spiritual quest. And professor, I mean, we have social philosophy, philosophy of language, political philosophy, dot, dot, dot. And Professor Arby is right about the use of classical concepts and common sphere of agreement regarding their use, without which a dialogue is not possible. I think that the real winners of the debate are us, the listeners or readers who can think further about these points, drawing on stellar philosophers such as Daya Krishna and Professor Albi. 520, my last section dedicated to my friend on here on my left, Daya Krishna on freedom. So I'm starting with a quote from another work by Daya Krishna, one of his last essays composed in 2006 titled the cosmic biological and cultural conditionings and the seeking for freedom we have to to read the titles slowly and to think about them the cosmic biological and, and cultural conditionings and the seeking for freedom this is almost a farewell essay written by that you passed away very shortly after i think that a younger Daya krishna would speak about the concept of freedom but this very late daiji is talking about the striving for freedom about our conditionings and the striving for freedom so he writes here i'm quoting freedom is not there once and for all something which one is born with that is intrinsic and innate to one or something irretrievable that one can never lose. Rather, it is as empirical as anything could be, limited, constrained, conditioned, and even to some, some extent determined. So this is the quote that I'm, star I'm starting with. Freedom, freedom. Naji prefers not to speak about freedom, but, to, but of freedoms with the plural S. He speaks about freedoms, about emp empirical freedoms that are limited, constrained, conditioned, and even to some extent determined, and I'll come to that in a few minutes. I'll, I, will, I will refer to this uh, essay, The Cosmic. I will not read to you the title uh, every time I, I mention the paper. So in The Cosmic, that Krishna aims his philosoph philosophical arrows at two notions of freedom disengagement as freedom and omnipotence as freedom that krishna aims his philosophical arrows to two notions of freedom this disengagement as freedom and omnipotence as freedom despite the difference between these two notions which daji extracts from patanjali's yoga sutra kaivalya and siddhi respectively kaivalya 
as disengagement, as freedom, and see the, the, the yogic powers as omnipotence, as freedom. So despite the difference between these two notions, Kaivalya and Siddhi, disengagement and freedom and omnipotence as freedom, there is a common denominator between them. Both notions pertain to ultimate freedom, freedom without any constraint whatsoever. But that Krishna har hardly aspires for freedom in the ultimate sense. He rather pleads in the cosmic and elsewhere for sobering up from what he sees as the illusion of ultimate freedom. The illusion of ultimate freedom. On Kaivalya or disengagement as freedom, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, KC Bhattacharya, KCB, that was mentioned here in our previous talk and will be mentioned here in the coming uh, seminar. So on Kaivalya, Kesi Bhattacharya, a contemporary commentator of Patanjali, in his hardly known work, Studies in Yoga Philosophy, from 1937, writes that, I'm quoting, yoga, that is yoga explica as explicated in the Yoga Sutra and its commentarial body, is essentially, I'm quoting KCB, the will to nivriti and not to pravriti, the will to mukti, to freedom as the power to stand distinct of power to create objective values indefinitely. This is Nivriti, this is KC Bhattacharya. For KCB, Pravati and Nivriti, outward facing and inward facing consciousness, respectively, Pravati, outer facing consciousness, Nivriti, inner facing consciousness, or if you wish, I'm translating, intentional consciousness and disengaged consciousness are forms of what he refers to as willing. Yoga in KCB's reading is willing toward sheer disengagement from the world and the worldly, from objects and objectification, and even from will itself. This is KCB. It is willing not to will. Correspondingly, the utmost yogic power conveyed by the phrase Chiti Shakti in Yoga Sutra, 434, the last verse of the Yoga Sutra, is what KCB refers to as the power to stand distinct of power. But that Krishna refuses to accept this narrative. It's a strong narrative from Patanjali to KC Bhattacharya. Why the outgoing movement of consciousness, Pravrati, he writes, should be regarded as something undesirable in itself, or the inward movement, intrinsically desirable, has remained the unasked question of the Indian tradition. I quote from another paper by Daya Krishna, I'm reading to you the text. I'm reading to you the text, uh, the, the title of the text. Uh, the Undeciphered Text, this is the title of, of Daya Krishna's article on the Yoga Sutra, The Undeciphered Text, Anomalies, Problems, and Paradoxes in the Yoga Sutra. You realize that so much has been written on the Yoga Sutra traditionally and contemporarily, and yet Daya Krishna refers to the Yoga Sutra as the undeciphered text. And this undecif undecipherability for him is what makes the text an interesting text for philosophizing. So Daji is asking why poverty is quote unquote bad, why nivrati is quote unquote good. This is the unasked question of the Indian tradition. Da Krishna prefers free travel between withdrawal and return between the flight mode of consciousness, if you wish, and full connectivity. But Daya Krishna does not merely argue that Nivriti and Pravriti complement one another. He further argues that free travel between them allows freedom from both. Yes, according to him, one needs to become free not just from his worldly mode of existence, but even from the freedom from the worldly. Moreover, that Krishna refuses to comply to the verdict given by consciousness itself when it retreats inwards that everything worldly is marginal or secondary. This connects with that Krishna's critique of self-centricity from Shankara to Descartes, from Shankara to Descartes. The feeling of I amness, as these two thinkers show, each in his, in his distinct way, is powerful, right? 
think it is powerful. And yet, there Krishna suggests misleading. The inbuilt limitations on one's freedom, he writes, and for me this is a crucial point, occur both at the poverty and the nivrity modes of consciousness. We usually consider merely the former, namely poverty as limited, and think of the obvious constraints at the outer level, namely the givenness of body and physicality and numerous restrictions related to our social and political life. But consciousness in itself, that Krishna suggests, is also limited. It depends on its own structure. This returns to the illusion of the, the illusion of the, in the beginning, there was the self. I'm talking about the, the first uh, sentence in two creation myths in the first chapter of the Bradaranika Upanishad, right? At my Vedam Agra Asit. In the beginning, there was the Atman, there was the self. So for Daji, what did I write here? For Daji, this is an illusion to think that in the beginning there was the self. Um, where am I? I lost my my text. Okay. Never mind. But that Krishna's dispute with the spiritualists who prefer nivrity over pravrity does not mean that he cannot understand the why and how of their position. Illusion and reality, he writes in the, in the cosmic, are both rooted in self-consciousness, which simultaneously feels itself transcending all that is an object to it, and yet feels restricted and constrained by it. Its relation to any object, whatever be its ontological status or nature, is always ambivalent and ambiguous, as it can neither accept, accept it or reject it. The subject cannot accept or reject the object. This is what Daya Krishna suggests. This paragraph that I just quoted corresponds with Kesi Bhattacharya again, with Kesi Bhattacharya's work, The Subject as Freedom, his famous 1930 a book, it's a full book, the sub subject is freedom. At the level of self-consciousness, that Krishna agrees with KCB, a spiritualist in his own way, one feels a sense of apartness from everything object objective. Objectivity is seen here as a limitation, and one is inclined to become absorbed in quote-unquote pure subjectivity. Subjectivity, which in KCB, borrows from the Advaitic notion of the Atman. This inherent ambivalence or naughty relationship between subject and object can lead to the conclusion, and this is indeed the spiritualist's conclusion, that the final separation or divorce is preferable. But that Krishna we saw refuses to accept this conclusion. Moreover, according to him, each of us has a responsibility toward the other, toward the world. And yet again, we saw that according to him, liberty or consciousness in itself has its own limitations, parallel to the more noticeable constraints of poverty, the worldly mode of consciousness. That Krishna continues to write that, I'm quoting him. The feeling of unrelatedness is founded on the illusion created by the fact of withdrawal, which is reflected upon, sorry, which if reflected upon sufficiently, would itself show its illusoriness. Withdrawal, obviously, he writes, is a withdrawal from something and makes sense only in relation to it. That Krishna puts the word withdrawal in quotation marks as to convey its paradoxality. Withdrawal makes sense only in relation to that from which one withdraws. Hence, withdrawal from the objective world, in fact, confirms and validates the very world that one claims to withdraw from, owing to its illusoriness. That Krishna returns to the crux of his critique of disengagement as, as freedom. The delusion, he writes, is structurally inbuilt in the nature of self-consciousness, as it cannot but see itself as the center of the world. We, we see ourselves as, as the center of the world. When I suffer from eye infection, I write, and see two moons up in the sky instead of one, if I may borrow a popular Advaitic illustration, I know that my eyes deceive me 
and dismiss what I see as error. Even if I continue to see two moons, in the same way, the eye of self-consciousness, this is Daji's argument, projects an erroneous picture of the self as the center. This picture that Krishna claims is the only conclusion that self-consciousness can come up with, owing to its operating system. This is how self-consciousness works. Da Krishna elaborates on this point in his work towards a theory of structural and transcendental illusions, towards a theory of structural and transcendental illusions, completed in 1998, but, but published only after he passed away in 2012. You won't believe it. I found a book in a Sig Hut, in a bookshop called the Harmony, but I already bought it. Uh, it's available on the website that I mentioned to you. So you can, you can look into, the, into this uh, book. The title, of course, uh, hints at Kant, right, towards the theory, and also, of course, the transcendental illusions. So Daji creates a dialogue between three gurus, Immanuel Kant, Kesi Bhattacharya, and Kalidas Bhattacharya, uh, Kesi Bhattacharya's son and, uh, and a philosopher in his own right, and Daya Krishna's own uh, teacher. Just like in the case of seeing two moons, when the self-consciousness I projects this picture that I am at the center, one should dismiss it as an illusion, Daji tells us. By using the term illusion, not error, that Krishna turns the tables on the Advaitic position. If the Advaitin, the exponent of Advaita, sees the world as illusion, then that Krishna implies that it is the, project, the projection of the world as illusory, which is the outcome of an illusion. The illusion that merely I, or the self, or the Atman, all three notions pointing at in the same direction, inwards, is indub indubitably real. In his paper, Fring Philosophy from the Prison House of Icentricity, listen to the title, Fring Philosophy from the Prison House of Icentricity from 2003, that Krishna further suggests that, I'm quoting, I'm almost at the end, don't worry. I'm quoting him. There, is, there can be no privileged subjectivity. It is only an illusion superimposed on oneself by self-consciousness and elevated to the status of the most indubitable fundamental certainty by the rope trick of the philosopher. Be his name Descartes, Fichte, Shankara, or anyone else. How do you say Fichte in English? Fichte, we say Fichte, we have this in Hebrew, Fichte, Fichte. Here Fichte is added to that Krishna's intricate network of philosophical correspondence. But I quoted this paragraph because of the phrase privileged subjectivity. That Krishna refers to the marginalization or peripher peripheralization of the worldly for the sake of the so-called privileged subjectivity as the rope trick of the philosopher. The trick is this, I mean, you know, a rope rises up to the air, someone climbs up and disappears. The metaphor, as used by Daya Krishna, conveys not just the decept deceptiveness of the feeling that I am the sun, I'm quoting him, I am the sun around which the planets revolve, unquote, as he puts it in, illusions in his book on on illusions but also the fantasy of ascending to skies above and beyond everything worldly however the worldly includes not just the objective realm but also the other you hence any notion of privileged subjectivity is always at the expense of the other the acknowledgement and the admission of other beings like oneself that Krishna writes in the cosmic, I'm quoting him again, would limit my freedom in a more fundamental and radical sense than the acceptance of all other types of being put together. The neglect and the denial of the importance of society, economy and polity, and polity in the thinking of most philosophers who have thought about these problems is an evidence of this. Just as the mystical, the spiritual, and the aesthetic consciousness has almost inevitably tended to do all the time. 
unquote. Da Krishna suspects that it is the inconvenience posed, quote unquote, inconvenience posed by the other, by the many, by their very existence that gave rise to the ideal of this of the self in itself. Are you following? The traffic jams in Banaras when you go out of the main gate of BHU is the reason that Advaita, I mean, I'm sorry, by Saab, is the reason that Advaita philosophy came into being. The traffic jam, there are things worse than traffic jams. Where am I? Gave rise to the ideal of the self in itself, away from everything and everyone else. The other is a threat on my freedom. Hence, one is quick to deny or to marginalize his existence. But for that, Krishna, the price of this move is intolerable. In the name of spirituality or mysticism or even aesthetics, but that Krishna's critique of the last theory of aesthetics is a, is a, is a theme for a separate uh, discussion. In the name of spirituality, everything else is denied. The world in which we live and everything else is too easily neglected. Freedom, that Krishna drives his point home, is not aloneness alone. Again, he targets the, the notion of Kaivalya, right? Aloneness, apartness. Freedom is not aloneness alone or aloneness all the time, but also intrinsically and inevitably with the other, or rather being with the other or others. They can be, they can be the source of enhancement, enjoyment, and deepening of one's freedom. Or if it is negation, constriction, lessening, and even turning it into its opposite, or feeling of bondage, of being imprisoned with, with nowhere to go, and being able to do nothing, just nothing. I didn't read it properly enough, but you can read it in Daji's own uh, article. And he closes by saying, hell is other people. Salt said. I mean, you know the, the, the play, no exit. Hell is other people, Daji quotes Salt. But so is heaven also. Hell is other people, but likewise heaven. This is a strong closure and a powerful response to Sartre's famous claim in his 1943 play, No Exit. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rave, for your expository lecture. Uh, due to want of time, we will have only two or three questions, and, but preferably from the students. If you have any questions, please. But we can entertain only one or two questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you, sir, for such a wonderful lecture. Um, from the Banta's point of the Krishna's notion of philosophy uh, regarding the freedom, what I believe that to understand a philosopher, it's a very quintessential that one must know his idea about freedom, what he talks about freedom, and what he says about self. These two are very prominent notions that one must be aware when he approaches to certain uh, approach to philosopher. So when Daya Krishna talks about omnipotence is freedom, does it make any reciprocity to the Nietzsche's will to power, because it's a little bit perplexity while, I mean, considering the, his idea of freedom in the context of omnipotence. Thank you, sir. I don't know if this will answer your question, but I want to suggest that that Krishna is not against anything. I, I, I was referring to his critique of a, B, C, D. That, that Krishna is not against moksha. That Krishna is not against power. That Krishna is interested in the notions of, in different notions of freedom. And I think that, that his analysis is, is, 
is enabling us to think about these notions of freedom. Are we interested in ultimate freedom? Is there anything as ultimate freedom? What is the difference? or the relationship between ultimate freedoms and empirical freedoms. I think that during the, the COVID period, during lockdowns, we, we, we started to appreciate many, quote unquote, empirical freedoms that are, are, are part of our lives and, and were taken from us, right, during, the, during the, the lockdown. So I think that basically that Krishna, sometimes he's, he's, the way he phrases things is very provocative. It is thought provoking. He's inviting us to think about about, about notions and concepts that we are so habitual to, to hear that we, we, we don't think about. Does it answer what you, you just uh, asked or remarked? And I think that it's again interesting to see that he's so well read in different traditions of thinking. And again, it, it gives him freedom, freedom to read different types of texts. It takes a, it takes a, a I mean, it raises the question of translation. I mean, if we want to read Western texts, Indian texts, classical Indian texts, so 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 in which language? I mean, this was raised also by by Anand. So in which language are are we reading? So there there's a, a there's a sense of translation that is needed to enable us to 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 have a, a broad vista such as the one uh, offered by, by Daya Krishna. And I think that it's also interesting, if you read Daya Krishna, to see that he has one foot rooted in classical Indian philosophy and another foot rooted in, in, in Western philosophy. The Western philosophy of his time. Because you know that Western philosophy, in the same way that Indian philosophy did not end with Shankara Acharya, despite what many classicists would claim, Western philosophy did not end with the with uh, Kant and, and Hegel, but also not with uh, Bertrand Russell and, uh, and Wittgenstein. I think that philosophy is moving forward, both in India and in the West, and by the way, in other thinking traditions. And Daiji's writings for me are an invitation to, to explore foreign landscapes, I mean, for, I mean different types of uh, texts. Uh, so, uh, I'm uh, Professor, please go ahead with your question. Hello, Ji. Namaskar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Namaskar, Ravaji. How are you? Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the very good exposition of uh, Professor Daya Krishna's uh, philosophy. Especially the later part, I like very much, which is not very much. We are not very much familiar with uh, the Daya Krishna's later papers and philosophical understanding of freedom. But what I was thinking after you, uh, the quote of Satra, the hell is other, and when Daya Krishna says other is heaven too. But there is a long way to go from hell to heaven. And this requires understanding of political, uh, different political ideologies. So my uh, question is, where will you place Daya Krishna in, in political philosophy, whether he is a conservative, progressive, socialist, communist, uh, or, or liberal, anti-liberal. So a person who gave so much importance, and I think this is this is the uh, best contribution of Daya Krishna, that, uh, that he gave social philosophy the status, which was never given in, in traditional Indian philosophy. But what after that, how to bring about that freedom with others. So is there any any answer to this in Daya Krishna? This is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alokji, for this uh, this uh, comment. Uh, so, so I want to ask you in, 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 in exchange question, you said, how would you define Daya Krishna as a leftist, rightist, liberal, communist? So how would you define uh, Nagarjuna? Nagarjuna is a, is a nihilist, is an absolutist, is a, I mean, I think that 
that some philosophers and that some philosophers cannot be adequately defined. And I don't think that Daiji is neither of these definitions that you have given. I think that he's he's moving moving between them in the same way that I, I, I suggested that his notion of freedom is a matter of movement, of free travel at will between the inside and the outside, between livreti and the livreti and pravreti. But again, you said something very deep and right, because I don't know if you noticed, just like Anna dear, I have shown you how many slides? 49 metaphorical slides, right? But I showed you only a few slides in the beginning and the last few slides. And there are 100 slides in, be 100 slides in between that I have not shown you. And if you really want to read that, Krishna, or, or contemporary Indian philosophy at large, of course, you have to read just like uh, Alok Tandan suggests. You have to read, to read Marx, and you have to read Sri Aurobindo, whose uh, picture is here on the wall. And you have to read Tagore, and you have to read Gandhiji, and you have to read many, many thinkers that influenced a philosopher such as uh, as uh, Daya Krishna. So, the, so the, certainly, this was just an introduction, a glimpse, a first visit, a window to Daiji's uh, philosophy. Thank you, uh, Professor Tanda. Thank you, thank sir, you very much. Sir, I'm also interested to ask a question, if I'm allowed, sir. So we have run out of time. So you okay, can sir. ask a question uh, to Professor da uh, Rave in person. You can meet him. You can call. He's, been, he's going to be here in Banaras. But he's not okay, thank you. Online. Okay. So can uh, can we allow? Okay. Rajan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, my question was on the last project of Daya Krishnanji, that when he is talking about Indian Renaissance, and, uh, you know, when he is bursting the myth about Indian philosophy, like that Indian philosophy is not all about spirituality, it is not authoritarian, and further he is also criticizing the idea that Indian idea of uh, Purushartha is not ex uh, inclusive. So I would be, uh, you know, limit myself to the first claim that why Indian philosophy is not spiritual. So I want to ask uh, uh, the speaker that do you agree with the their research, uh, you know, approach to the idea of spirituality? Because when he is saying that Indian philosophy is not about spirituality, he somehow limits to the idea that all thinkers uh, assume soul in the center. But I think that spirit spirituality is a very inclusive term, which talks about the question of what is the meaning of life or who actually I am. So I want first this thing that what is the what is the you know Daya Krishna approach to the very idea of spirituality? Isn't isn't he a quite exclusive in in this sense? And second question is that uh, like when he is claiming that if any person is not you know doing philosophy in Indian philosophy in Sanskrit, then he is not basically pursuing philosophy at all. So what is your approach in this regard, and what is our what is our future? in Indian philosophy if you are not very much apt in the Sanskrit. So these are the two questions pertaining to, pertaining to his last project, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, for these uh, numerous questions in uh, one. You're actually referring to different writings of Daya Krishna. Um, so, so, so let me say the following. I think that, that Daji wants to create a balance. There is so much talk about spirituality. There is so much talk about what Kesi Bhattacharya, which I refer to as a spiritual, spiritualist in his own way, refers to as the subject as freedom. So that Krishna brings forward an alternative notion, the alternative of the object as freedom. What about the object as freedom? And then we can play, play not in a, I mean, in the most serious sense of the word play. We can play with these two notions of the subject as freedom, and the, no, and, and the object is freedom. Definitely, Daya Krishna leads us not to forget the social, not, for, not to forget the, 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 the political. But is he really anti-spiritual? I don't think that he is anti-spiritual. I mean, read his books, read even, read the, the, the dedication, that you, the, the, the first few lines of his book, it's coll 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 is, he's collected the essays which is called The Art of the Conceptual, uh, published in 1989. 
So he basically dedicates the book to all the cosmic forces that helped him or helps us, a past, present, and future, something which, which looks very spiritual. And in, in a sense, it's like starting with a mantra. There is something so classical in opening, in opening a book in this way. But that Krishna strives for freedom. He doesn't want to think about Indian philosophy as subordinated to the spiritual quest as it has been done so many times. The point is, and now I'm going to, again, to throw something here that we, we, don't, we don't have time to, 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 to discuss. Many, many positions which, which are considered nowadays to be classical or conservative positions are in fact colonial pictures internalized in India. So the, the, the fact that moksha is the crux of the matter, is it not a colonial uh, narrative? Because you see, the colonialists were very willing to, 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 to see India as, as, as the, the locus of spirituality. Why? Because it gives them monopoly over rationality. This whole idea that Indian philosophy is spiritual and Western philosophy is rational. Listen to Da Krishna. I mentioned to you the website. There are three audio recordings of Da Krishna's last series of talks in Shimla in 2005. And Da Krishna, actually, I said it to you in our previous meeting. Da Krishna says the West rational. Of course, the West is rational. Everything started with the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers and then uh, Plato. And after Plato, Aristotle, and after Aristotle, Descartes. What happens between Aristotle and Descartes? Nothing. We closed the light, it was already five, we had to go home. We came the next morning and, and it was Descartes. So this is, what, what about the Western spirituality? What about spirituality from the Greek time to Christianity? I mean, to hundreds of years of Christianity. Nowadays, of course, so much work is, is written on, on, on Christianity, and Western philosophy, I'm not sure that this work finds its way into India. And the Indians so proudly adopted the narrative, we are spiritual. And Da Krishna, I mean, listen to Da Krishna in the Shimla lectures. Da Krishna says, did we not have, did we not have science in India? Did we, not, did, did we not have architecture? Did we not have mathematics? And sarcastically, he says, no, we are... We are temple builders. But then he continues, continues to say, but in order to build a temple, and come on, yeah, this is Banaras. See the temples of Banaras. Today I went to the, to the, to the, to the Bharat Kala Bhavan. I saw the, the, the beautiful uh, statues in the morning. I don't know when you visited the uh, BKB lab. So for this, I mean, so much technology, so much science, so much art, so much sense of aesthetic is needed, but no, everything is, is removed the side. No, we are spiritual and the West is uh, rational. And you know what I'm talking about? We, we, we keep on reading these articles, af article after article. The West is rational and we are spiritual. And are for, unfortunately in this country, many students of philosophy are not interested in Indian philosophy because they feel that this is not real philosophy. This is religion. This is philosophy subordinated to religion. Whereas Western philosophy looks to them, and I'm, talk, I'm talking about my experiences, not here, but elsewhere. Whereas Western philosophy looks or sounds as religion free. So Daiji tries to break this division the so-called division between the spiritual Indian philosophy and the Western, uh, the, the, the rational Western philosophy. But I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that he was not anti-spiritual in any sense. He was trying to broaden the scope. Thank you, Professor Ravi. Daya Krishna was not an idol worshiper. He was an ICLO class par excellence. So with this comment, I would like to invite Professor Anand Vedde to deliver his presidential remarks. Thank you, sir. Hello? Hello? Oh, oh okay. Um, yes, it's wonderful. Every time I hear Daniel speak, I'm, I'm more... Um, inspired to change the way I do philosophy and become more liberated in how I discuss and present philosophy. So thank you very much. I 
very much aspire to your style. That kind of rhymes, actually, aspire to your style. Um, there's so many comments I could make that it would take too long, so I'm just going to restrict myself to, like, three. Um, let's start with the last one. I think Daniel's presentation of this point in Daya Krishna about spirituality and rationality is absolutely correct. And also, the sad fact in my personal life is that I came to learn of Daya Krishna way too late because I felt these things most of my youth. I thought, this can't be right. People tell this to me all the time, yet I find in what I know of Indian philosophy, lots of things that are going on that have to do with rationality and logic. And I find places where spirituality isn't that discussed. And because I had a very large training in the history of Western philosophy, I actually studied the whole series twice. Um, I was very shocked to learn how many Western philosophers don't know any medieval philosophy. They basically exactly follow the story that was just told. They simply turn off basically around... I don't know, maybe maybe a little bit past Aristotle. You get the Epicureans, you get Epictetus, and then they just turn off. They know no Porphyry. They know no Plotinus. They know Aquinas, no Aquinas Anselm, Abelard, Duns Scotus, Occam, Peter, of Abel Peter Abelard. They know none of that. They know none of what these people talked about. They know none of the spiritual ways in which they explored things. They know nothing about the deep relationship between ideas and Indian philosophy and uh, about Yogaja Pratyaksha and intuition in uh, medieval thought. They know nothing about mystical experiences or capital cataleptic experiences in medieval philosophy. And so they simply assume that there is this dominant story of rationality in Western philosophy, which is just completely false. There is a, no evidence of this whatsoever on any circumspect sort of wide-angled reading of all the actual periods. And in fact, when I got hired at the current university, I teach it. I asked my faculty members why there was no class in medieval philosophy, given that it was the very period of philosophy that turned me from being a chemistry student to a philosopher, and also the one I enjoy the most. And they were like, well, it's kind of like the Dark Ages, right? So, oh, we delete the Dark Ages, and therefore we get the light of reason in all the other ages. So this is, this, this, this is very true. I think this is a very correct interpretation of how some people can walk around and basically echo this theme uncritically. They just simply lack knowledge of history in Western philosophy. And also, I think it's also true of Indian philosophy, because when I started to learn about the Nyaya system, I completely was obsessed with it, and I'm still obsessed with it now. It's a realist school. It's very strongly in, about logic and epistemology and ontology. The Vaisheshika system is the same way. But at some point in time, people followed what Radhakrishnan said and took Advaita Vedanta to be the contribution of India to the world. And this is sometimes echoed in my own thought as what is known as the pizza, pizza pasta problem. Some people like to think that Italy's contribution to the world is pizza and pasta. But if you go to Italy and actually taste the food, you'll find that there are so many great things going on that you probably won't want pizza and pasta. If you go to India and actually study Indian philosophy, you'll find that Advaita Vedanta is one thing like pizza and pasta, but it's not everything. There's so many other things to sample and taste. And they're wonderful also. So I think this is also part of the issue in the world's reception. So I fundamentally agree with this. And in my book review of Daniel's book, I made this point front and center from Daya Krishna to show that this is actually very important. Point number two. The stuff about freedom in Daya Krishna to me is extremely important because I find that in Daya Krishna, there is a huge conversation to be had with contemporary work being done on freedom in analytical philosophy. And the reason why is precisely because of the point that he echoed about the notion of freedom as understood in Daya Krishna that he's challenging, which is about um, disengagement or omnipotence, which are both notions that are otherworldly. They're sort of final ends type of things. You either achieve it at the end or it's something that God has, but it's not something that we have in our ordinary experience. And much of the discussion in contemporary analytic philosophy is about the very notion that is presented in Daya Krishna, like the one that's limited by empirical means. So in some sense, I find a rich conversation with what Daya Krishna is trying to do with freedom and contemporary debates in analytical philosophy about freedom. But also, the thing that is exciting me is precisely what Professor Mukhopadhyay was talking about. 
I find not a comparison and a contrast to be relevant, but I find an intervention that's very interesting. In the little reading I have done of Dead Crush on Freedom, it seems to me like he's concerned with, not to say that the stuff about freedom and traveling isn't important, but he's also concerned in certain passages with the fact that there is the feeling, the phenomenology of freedom, and sometimes in our lives the phenomenology of freedom is what is the important point that we're talking about. That I feel free in doing a certain activity, or I feel coerced through a social process, or I feel constrained by my obligations. These are all notions that are phenomenological. They, it feels a certain way to be in a familial discussion about something and feel constrained by the weight of reasons of some, even though in another very other sense, you are free to choose whatever you want, right? So the phenomenology of free experiences is something that I find at least pops out to me in the one paper I read by Daya Krishna. I'm sure there's a lot more for me to learn. So I find a rich intervention about the role of the freedom free experiences into the contemporary debate. In analytical philosophy, the most common conversation about freedom is about a very famous principle articulated by Harry Frankfurt from Princeton University called the principle of alternative possibilities, which says that one is morally responsible for doing something only if they could have done otherwise. And what does it mean for one to have been able to do otherwise? It means that there was genuinely some action that they could have done at the time at which they chose the other action. And then what it's oftentimes showed is that if you take, for example, the laws of physics and the deterministic nature of the laws of physics, it robs us of our freedom because those laws say that what was not in our control in the distant past is determining what's going on now. This is called the famous consequence argument from Peter Van Inwagen. And both of these conversations focus on a metaphysical notion of freedom that is below the level of phenomenology. But in Daya Krishna, I find that the focus of conversation is more on the phenomenology of free experiences, the one that we are responsible for in the sense that we talk that way to each other. Oh, I kind of feel coerced to go to this meeting, or I kind of feel like I have to do that. Or, oh, wow, today I feel very free to do what I want to do. Those notions aren't tied into notions within physics that depend on the nature of physical laws and the determinism in physical laws. And so this inner engagement between Daya Krishna on the phenomenology of free experiences in a world where we're empirically limited by actual people and actual institutions, seems to me quite an intervention to make. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, 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 I will learn more. Um, um, and, then, and then and then the first point, I believe for reading Daniel's book that um, it is true that in some sense, not in some sense, but in a big sense, that work on Daya Krishna and 20th century uh, Indian philosophy is a very fertile ground that will make a lot of people who don't know a lot about Indian philosophy want to gravitate towards it. And I actually think that in some ways this is going to be one of the most exciting periods to be working on Indian philosophy because of the amount of stuff that's coming out now where people are turning to look at 20th century Indian philosophy and the thinkers who wrote both in English and in Hindi and Bengali and quoted from Sanskrit because this is accessible to a wide audience. So I feel that the, the, the thing that Daniel told me the other day on the road, that he's the prophet of 20th century Indian philosophy, to me is absolutely correct. Sure, yeah. No, but it's true in some ways. I kind of feel you are. So in some ways, I think this is really important because the opportunity here for a lot of people to be involved in a global conversation is very rich because many people in the West still believe that Indian philosophy ended in 1732 because after that, there was influences from other sources, and from then, there's nothing called Indian philosophy anymore. But as we see in the 20th century, there are so many rich discussions across so many figures, all of their names uh, are pictures on the wall, and there's no reason why we can't have a grand old discussion in the years to come. So with that, I would like to thank Daniel for his wonderful presentation and the inspiration he gives all of us to be great philosophers. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Professor Anand Vaidya, for your presidential remarks. Now, in, to conclude this session, I would like to invite Dr. Rahul Moria for proposing the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir, for asking me to propose vote of thanks. I'm really delighted and feel honored to uh, give vote of thanks. Uh, I'm Dr. Rahul Kumar Mohar, Assistant Professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religion. On the behalf of 
department and our head. I would like to extend hearty thanks to Professor Daniel Rabe for really choosing an interesting topic, uh, uh, Daya Krishna uh, retrospective philosophy, a philosoph philosophical uh, retrospective, where he chose to present his personal encounter to uh, with uh, Professor Daya Krishna, and he also uh, engaged at length uh, his philosophical trajectory and the way he has presented. Right, uh, though I have heard a lot about. Daya Krishna, but I haven't read personally. But now I think after his presentation, he has opened a door for many of us to engage Daya Krishna seriously. So thank you so much for really uh, uh, making a fantastic and fabulous presentation on this interesting topic that he chose to deliver on. Now I would like to extend uh, thankfulness to uh, Professor Anand Jayaprakash Vaid, who uh, sat for long and uh, agreed to chair the session. So you really deserve a great applaud. Thank you so much, sir for being with us today. Uh, I would also like to extend our uh, hearty thanks to our head, who has been always a uh, source of encouragement, and he has been always instrumental in all kinds of uh, academic activities that we take up in this department. So thank you so much, sir, uh, for uh, always encouraging us. And let me also thank our many of our professors of this department who have been here. Uh, I can see Professor Rajesh Kumar Jha and uh, Dr. Uh, Grace Darling, Madam, was also there. Uh, Dr. Bagre is also here. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Choresia has also come to attend this talk. So thank you, sir. And uh, and uh, I can see Dr. Alok Tandon, who has been a uh, constant, uh, you can say, participant in our seminar. So thank you so much, sir, for joining this uh, talk and making it uh, engaging. So uh, and I can see uh, in the morning session, uh, Professor S.P. Pandey was also there, uh, Dr. Kalpana was also there, Dr. Priyanka was also there, and Dr. Rajiv is also sitting. So uh, all those uh, colleagues who have been here and making their active participation, thank you to all of you. And uh, let me also thank our research scholars and students who are uh, the very important component of any uh, academy adventure that we take. So thank you very much to everyone for being with us and making this seminar engaging. Thank you.